So, how, yeah, Howie B. Exactly. Exactly. We're going to catch up with Howie B. It's been a long time. Over 25 years. It was in 96, February 96, if memory serves me correct, when he was on Party Zone, just before he went mega as U2 support DJ, but not just a support DJ. He was producing them all. He was the vibes man. I don't think he liked being called the vibes man. Funny though, right? He's a very ta- It's yeah, funny. I mean, that, that, that quote stuck with me too, that he was basically hired to provide the vibes. <laughs> it's like, what is that? You know, you know what? I think, and dare I say it, I think a lot of, this is a real controversial statement, but arguably without naming names, I think there's a lot of people out there in music who are not so hands-on. Now, he's very hands-on. He was a fantastic engineer, Howie B, but a lot of people are, quote, producers. And are they really, you know, making the music? Is it not maybe this engineer, that engineer, that one? There's a lot of people who are ideas people who get the credit for even writing songs or being the producer and being vibes people. You know, it's very interesting sometimes, I think. There's certain, again, I, won't, I don't want to, you know, name and shame, but there's some big artists who, for example are writers on their music or claim to be producing so you and mean you so you mean line? so you mean like Damien Hurst who has like a whole team of people who basically make yeah. the stuff that he conceptually did. thinks things up and he could put his name to it right. and in fact in some of these interviews i think it's this great magazine here the wire from january 96 i think they talk a lot about look at him there <laughs> Wow. With a, with a Tower record sticker over his nose. Uh, <laughs> but they talk a lot about those, you know, people getting the credits who might not have written it. You know, the engineer. I'm not going to, again, it's not good to, you know, slate people. I think sometimes people get more credit than they actually deserve. Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's just that some and people should around. be getting more credit than they are. Let's put it that way. It's not that the producer doesn't have any input, but sometimes you might have engineers who, who really put their own stamp on stuff and who don't get the credit. Maybe it's a bit more like that. Yeah, I'll give you a good example, actually, who, who's someone who Howie B was very closely affiliated with because he released records on the Mo Wax label. It's James Lavelle. Now, he gets a lot of stick for people saying, oh, what did you do? You know, you were a bit of a vibes man in the studio. You know, having really, I'm very fascinated by James Lavelle and what he's done, equally Howie B. But when you look at their body of work and what they've done, I mean, arguably, James Lavelle's very important. He brought, brought a lot of people together. He's, could you not say, an orchestrator, someone who brings all the elements, and that can be the packaging of the record, how something looks, how, you know, is arguably as important as the engineer the vocalist. It's mm-hmm. the teamwork, isn't it? It's all those elements coming together. Yeah. So DJ for U2's Pop Mart tour, well, a tour at that time, I think in 1997, apparently that tour was costing $250,000 a day to run. He was hanging out with Liam Gallagher. Is he in touch with any of these people anymore? It's kind of interesting. I mean, you know, Oasis was supporting U2 in San Francisco on that tour. So he, he hung out with the mm-hmm. real who's who. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're, with you too, and you've got a strong role with you too. You're going to be meeting a lot of very interesting people yeah, and, and have a lot of very interesting anecdotes. In fact, your whole interview could have a mighty chunk of those anecdotes. And he was wor- if he wants to talk about. And he them. was working with Bjork. He was working with yep. Tricky. Massive attack. Right. I mean, yep. some really amazing people. So soul to soul, soul to soul. Susie and the Banshees. Wow. Nick Rogue, the filmmaker as a kind of, again, a bit of a vibes and giving soundscape. Very talented guy. Mm. His Pussyfoot label, stuff he did on the Mo Wax label, beautiful videos with Runrake, and Runrake also doing some nice um, stuff for U2's Pop Mart tour. See how it all gels together? Mm-hmm. I'm one thing I like, I think it's interesting to ask him. Um, well, two things, actually. Two interesting uh, cultural events. I think he talks about taking the edge once to a gay Puerto Rican disco in New York. <laughs> And the edge is brilliantly dressed. He's in his kind of village people outfit with his boots on and, you know, got his droopy moustache and his cowboy hat. You oh, know, so funny. that was probably yet again an amazing evening. He it's a great may want to remember, mental may image. not want to remember. I like that. That's funny. Yeah. I'm interested in his roots. Mm-hmm. I mean, he grew up a Jewish kid 
in Glasgow in a kind of Catholic Protestant environment. How did that shape him? Wow, interesting. Must have had some effect on him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Howie Bernstein, being his real name, shortened to be. Is he, is he, is he religious in any way now? Mm-hmm. I mean, anti-Semitism is a big thing if you're Jewish. Yeah. But is that, and of course, what has he been up to since, you know, you were there on that couch with him? If I remember, it was all nice pink. I think there's clips on YouTube. It was a kind of weird little sofa, wasn't it? It, it was kind it was of, it was like light. cushions it was on the lit. It was cushions on the cushions. floor. We were just kind of sitting on the yeah, floor. Yeah. I remember that. You were vibesing. You were vibesing. Definitely vibesing. Yes. Yeah. No, it's it's going to be really good fun. I'm looking forward to chatting with him. I'm sure, like you said, he's got some amazing stories to tell. So yeah, it's gonna oh. it's gonna be good. Just as I say, just yeah, just from that one article alone. Yeah. So yeah, enjoy. Thank you. Hello. Hello. I have Howard Bernstein, aka Howie B, on the show. Thank you. Hello there. How are you? How are you? It's been it's been a very long time. It has, hasn't it? I can't quite remember exactly the year. I do know that it was just before things really blew up with you. I know that. Yeah, I think it was round about. I think it was like ninety six, something like that. It could be. Um my memory but um yes thank yes. you for being on the show again and you know let's start with that so you know howard bernstein howie b was that name the the nickname you already had growing up or at school or was it the name that you took the obvious name you took when you started to make it's music a, well it, it, the name was given it, it happened uh whenever i was doing the soul to soul stuff with nelly and jazzy dolby uh daddy you know daddy harvey hb all those peeps and then one day uh, nelly turned around to me nelly hooper said uh, i think you should call yourself how we be and i went that's what i'm going to call myself it, it was like about you know the decision took about two seconds how and i went okay yeah how we be that works for me it's, and, uh, it's so obvious right it makes sense yeah yeah, yeah. it made sense it, it was it was good. It was a little bit. What was? It was quite American at the time. This was like nineteen eighty-eight, eighty-nine. So people were like a bit confused whenever they met me, and all of a sudden, I had this Scottish accent. Uh, they were like, "Wait a minute, you're not from America?" I, no, no, I'm from Glasgow. <laughs> so it was. It was a little bit of a. It was a wee bit of a sort of like a, a left turn for people. Quite. So that was interesting. So that, that's how the name came about. It was literally one one night we were in down in Britannia Road Studios doing doing the first Soul to Soul album. And uh, yeah. yeah, and Nelly came up because that's your name, Harry. I go Nice. Yep. Nice. Yep. So um talking about coming from Glasgow, I actually have yeah. um there's a, a magazine article that James Hyman has dug out that talks about yeah. your childhood and growing up in um in Glasgow, so let me just try uh, okay. and share that with you. Uh... This is The Wire magazine. As a Jewish boy growing up amid the Protestant versus Catholic sectarianism of Glasgow, Howie was an isolated adolescent who divided his time and passion between 70s cosmic jazz fusion and reading radical psychoanalysis and mystical thinkers such as R.D. Lang, Gurdjieff, Uspensky. He actually studied psychology in Manchester, but quit when he realised that the only thing in which he was qualifying was taking drugs and partying. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. That, that, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack. Uh, what's, what's really so interesting... So let's start maybe with you growing up. So you're a Jewish boy growing up in an area yeah. where it's all the Catholics against the Protestants. I mean, not actually fighting, but there was a lot of strife. So what was that like? Let's start with that one. It was really interesting. Uh, it was it was an interesting one because the, even even uh, it, it was it was down to what football team you supported. Hmm. Uh, so. And also, also what school you went to, because the schools, uh, like the government schools in Glasgow, 
there were Protestant schools, and, and it still is to this day, Protestant and Catholic schools. And they were quite often beside each other. And so I was in between this, uh, I don't know, this sort of, there was animosity that was going on between uh, two different re uh, religions. And I, and I was like, I don't quite get what's going on here. No. I don't get it. I didn't get it. So did you go and to a Catholic school or a Protestant school? I went to a Protestant school. Wow. You know what? It's funny, actually, because at one point, it was in 1988 in Ibiza, I met a group of Scottish guys, and that was their first question to me. You know, I'm from the Netherlands, but they met me and they were like, are you Protestant or Catholic? And I went, yeah. I don't know. And they said, well, okay, what school do you go to? And I went, Protestant. And they said, what about your family? I said, well, my mum's an atheist and my dad is meant to be Catholic, but he doesn't go to church. And I said, and I sing in a church choir, but we sing at a Catholic mass and at the Protestant service. So I don't know. So they yeah. basically just assigned me. I can't remember what they assigned me, but they thought I had enough yeah. of one or the other to assign me yeah. to their group so that they could be friends with me. But it was just nuts, right? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. And, and, and the way that me and, and the group of people that I were hanging out with, we figured out was we just we just listened to music right we, we went round to each other's houses we put on records and we listened to music and it didn't matter what who or what we were listening to reggae we were listening to Susie and the banshees we were listening to folk music we were yeah. listening to rock santana john mclaughlin right and, and that that music and our love of music between all of us, all, all this group of people, that's what brought us together. And that's what saved us, to be quite honest. Yeah. That saved us. And, and as soon as I was like about literally 17, it was like, okay, time to leave. Wow. Time to get out of here because it was, it was really on top. Wow. And, uh, and, so, but, and, uh, but, but was there a lot of music in your, in your own family as well? Were you parents, musicians or, or no, anything like no, that? No, no, no. Did, did no, you train? No. Did you train? I mean, did you play instruments growing I did. up? I, I, I went to tap dancing. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> expect that. <laughs> <laughs> I had a great tap dancing uniform, Simone. It was beautiful. You should have seen me in oh. those days. Oh, that's yeah. so funny. You should have pulled that skill out shit. like during a DJ show. Yeah. <laughs> or something and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been so yeah, good. yeah, no, and um, and uh, no, my my parents in terms of music, it was like I remember I turned around to my dad and I said, "Look, uh, I want to get into music." You know, I, you know, after after I did the psychology thing, I went down to Manchester and I did that. I came back and I went, "Okay, this is not working. This is this is not working for me. I want to do music." And then he turned around to me and goes. Wait, so what instrument do you play? I go, I don't play any instruments. Can you read music? No, I can't read any. I can't read a note of music. And I go, and I said, but that's what I want to do. I know I can do something in there. I can feel it. And uh, and, and I said, will you support me? And he goes, no. He goes, no. You've got to go and get yourself a proper job. Oh, that's what he said. Get oh, a proper job. Oh, how funny. Uh, and at that point... Uh, I left home. <gasps> wow. And that was it. And, and it was good. It was a brilliant one. It was actually a good little thing. It's good when someone says no to you. Hmm. Because it actually instills, like, I'll show you what. And, and well, literally, think, like, it. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that's the difference between people who really succeed in life and those who don't. I mean, that is the moment. When someone says no, is that like a red flag to a bull? Or do you then give up? And the ones who see it as the red flag to the bull, the ones who go, oh, really? I'm going to yeah. show you. Yeah. You think I can't do it? I'll prove it to you. Those are the ones that succeed, usually, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not, I, I don't know whether that's a, gen, that's a big generalization there. That is. Yeah. I get and, that feeling, and, though. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's it's the a, feeling. No, I know. It's a good one. It's a good one. It, it, it's, I think, I think a no, 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 it can be the one of the most positive things that can happen to you in your life. Hmm. Someone said, 
So yes, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you and I disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your psychology coming out there? Has your, the psychology, no. the stuff that you learned, has that helped you as a producer, as an engineer? Like, have you been able to kind of make use of that? Do you understand? Can you read people better because of that? Maybe? I think the book, I think the books that I've read and the conversations and the poetry I've read mm. and the songs I've listened to, that's what makes me a yeah. uh, uh, good producer. Right. Yeah. I think it's uh, am, I think it's amazing to when you said that you didn't actually play any instruments, you can't read music. And yet you're so incredibly skilled. I mean, the thing that is so special, I think, about you is that, um, at least I get this feeling, that if someone says to you, I want it to sound like a spring day, I want it to sound like dark, I want it to sound scary, that you, whatever emotion or, or feeling, that you are actually able to then get the sounds exactly just so to create that. Am, am I, is that, am I right in... In yeah, way. I mean, I love, I, I, Simon, you hit the nail right in the night. I love those corners. Mm. Like the, when, when a band or when an artist or singer or a songwriter that I'm working with comes up with these requests, I want it to sound red. Mm -hmm. And I go, okay, wow. great. Yeah, you get it. You know, you I know, love and, that. and That's it's magic. Yeah, I want it to sound red. I, you know, and it's it's like, so then I, that that request goes into me, goes into my little noodle, and then my experience in in what my life experience comes out. That's my my action. My action comes out from that, hmm. <clears throat> and I got I. I, I, the skills that came, the skills in terms of atmosphere came from my time working with, uh, working in Lily Yard Studios right, with, with Hans Zimmer, Hans Zimmer. Right? yeah, yeah, and uh, and another guy called Stanley Myers. So Hans was the electronic sort of side of this uh, production team, and Stanley was the more classical slash jazz side of it and those guys were like uh, I would say top of the pyramid of expressing emotions huh. and how to put those emotions or atmospheres into music wow. uh, and it, it could be just one note it could be one note or it could be a drone or it could be a chord or it could be a jazz band coming in. That three years I worked with those two guys, that was, I, I'd say, another beautiful color of, of where I'm coming from. It's, it's so magical, isn't it, though? I mean, the whole, I love the idea as well that basically when you're making music, really all you're doing is you are moving molecules. You're making molecules vibrate, which then go into someone else's ear let that yeah. is the, the eardrum vibrate and that gets translated mm. into the sound. I mean, the whole thing is just so out there. And then you can actually take an emotion or a word like red and you can translate that into sound. It's just like, it's mind blowing. Yeah, well, it's not. The more you go into your mind about it, then the less that actually happens. Right. It's like it, it's it's, it's, it's about action. It's yeah. It's a feeling. It's action. It's action. Mm -hmm. It's like, and also not being uh, what's the word, selfish about it. Yeah. You know, it's like you've got to have that conversation with the artist, the composer, whoever it is you're with, even a director of a, of a film. I do like with film scores. You've got to listen. The most important thing is to listen and actually hear where they are, what, what is actually happening in, 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 their, in their soul. What do they want to express? Yeah. <clears throat> and and then, that, then the challenge happens. It's like, okay. And then with the, if, if I was 
if someone asked me to do red when I was 18, I would just get out a, a crayon and I would do red. Right. A red crayon. You know, Karen Dash. Uh, I'm just giving a note to my sponsor, Karen Dash. But, uh, but you would just do that. But no, I'm, that's not... It's like, okay, so you you just use your... Ex I use my experience of working with different orchestras, different bands, etc. And then I go, okay, I think this might be right. Actually, there's an interesting... There's another interesting quote. I'm going to play that for you. So hold on one sec. Brian Eno kept a diary and he says... On December the 6th, 1995, this is an extract from Brian Eno's diary. The thing you two want from Howie is his weird sense of space, his ability to leave things alone and let the listener do the work. Yeah. Yep. That, that, I mean, I, I can, it, it, that, that is it. Uh, for me, uh, even when I'm making my own music, Forgetting producing, forgetting all of that. But even when I'm making my own music, I've got to step back and go, is this giving me some, is this letting me go somewhere? Mm -hmm. Or is it too much information coming at me? And if it's too much information, I either delete. Normally I delete and I just start again. I'm not precious about what I do. I'm not precious about my own uh, music. So, you know, I'm not like, oh, I've got to keep that in the pocket for... Just in enough. case. Just in case. <laughs> Just in case. No, the space... I love, uh, I love the idea of uh, space. Uh, that was my route really into music was, okay, what... Well, what is my signature here? What is my what's my signature? My signature is space. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know it's interesting because other artists have said this. I know that Picasso used to say it about a painting. He said a painting is not just about the objects you see on the canvas, it's also the space between the objects. And I know that right. Miles Davis used to say it as well about his music. He said it's not just about the notes I play. It's about the space or the air between those notes. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And it's also respect as well. Respect to, okay, for Picasso's respect to the person that is standing in front of his painting and going, oh, and where that takes that person to. For me, it's the same. Uh, I respect the people that listen to my music. Uh, I adore the people that listen to my music and and also to my productions. And, and it's about uh, instilling in them, uh, I would say, nothing to do with the head. It's to do with just the, the, the action just the action of listening and what happens when one listens, uh, which happens in conversation, happens in music, happens in art, happens in architecture, happens everywhere. But I'm, I'm, also, I'm, I'm almost wondering if the spaces are actually the harder parts. I think especially in the kind of culture where we live, we like to yeah. feel everything, you know, like in conversations, yeah. as soon as there is a silence, we're inclined to fill it, you know, it's something, there's something scary about leaving something open. So do you think that sometimes out of, out of insecurity, people layer their music too much that you almost need a certain level of confidence to just step back and go. I th yeah. That's, a, that's, is that a rhetorical question? I, no, I'm asking you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. For me, it's yeah. like, for me, like there was, there was one producer I worked with, right? This is when we were in analog and we had 24 tracks in the tape machine. 20, track 24 was the code, which was telling the machines what to do. And his limit was 23. Even when we got to like track 10 and the track was sounding brilliant, 
Oh no, I've got, I've still got another eight tracks to go. And he would, and, and I'll, I'll go, look, <laughs> it's done. No, no, I've got, I've got another eight tracks or whatever to go. I've got to fill them up. And of course, all of a sudden, this beautiful groove song, yeah. all of a sudden became this, I don't know. I, I, and it was, and this, this, this is, this is, and it's even more common now today. I get mixes sent to me. Uh, Harry, will you mix this song? Yep, I'll mix it. I hear, I hear the demo of it. The demo is that a guy in a guitar sitting in the bedroom playing it and he's singing a song and then all of a sudden, four weeks, and I hear that and I go, well, that's a beautiful song. Four weeks later, I've gone into the studio and I've got 128 tracks. 25 to tra tracks of guitar, la 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 and the song has disappeared. Oh. It's just totally disappeared. Wow. And, and that's very common today, especially with this, I mean, I'm not being negative about digital, but there's no limit. There's no limit. Exactly. It was brilliant uh, when, when we were, you know, in the 80s. I mean, I'm not like being a Luddite, but whenever we we had a limit to what we could actually do, yeah. we pushed it. And it was like, you know, if, if you listen to like, you know, Annie Lennox and the songs that she was doing with Dave Stewart in the 80s, they were recorded on four track. Wow. wow. If you listen to the, the songs that, the most beautiful soul songs in the world, like they were recorded in the 60s and the 70s, Four or eight track maximum. Wow. And it's like, and they sound full and they touch us and mm -hmm. boom. It's, there's something to be learned from that. It's not digital versus analog. It's to do with I, I, the concept of enough. That's, that's, that's what it's about. Yeah, and I think also in a way then today you need to be even braver to leave certain imperfections because to me the more perfect same with a person if a person is just perfect looking yeah. i often find yeah. them quite dull looking i prefer to see people yeah. who look a little bit different from everyone else and who are not quite perfect yeah. and to me that just makes yeah. everything more interesting and the same with music if you listen to old yeah. Beatles songs there's mistakes in there and they're still in there yeah. And yeah, I yeah. love that kind of, because you don't quite know what to expect. It, it keeps you on your toes a little bit. And if all the music is just perfect, it just gets a bit yeah. too dull, I think. It, it's, to do, it's to do with uh, just really us as human beings, as, as, as people. Life, we listen, you know, like the conversation just now, I'm hearing little cars going by and la 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 la. That's real. It's real. Mm -hmm. It's real. It's like you. I record a singer, and then uh, the singer goes, "Can you take my breaths out?" Take I'm it sorry. Out. Take it yeah. out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can you take my breathing? Can you take my breathing out? No. I go. I go. <laughs> you breathe for fuck's sake. You know. Exactly. I just wanted to come in on. You know. I go. <gasps> All right. <gasps> bah, 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 bah. Yep. The breath is, it's real, it's real. And, and with drummers, if you listen to all our favorite Rolling Stones or whatever albums, or la, la 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 la, beautiful soul albums, you know, Curtis Mayfield, etc. The tempo is like, it's like going like that. Now everything is like on the grid. It's like this, like this, like this. And it's like, wait a minute and our attention span whenever we hear stuff like that it, it it gets it's like wait a minute there's something up here we don't physically or verbally say it but literally we're now down to listening to songs that last for one minute bang and then we switch it yeah. because it's like it's like uh, 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 no no that was french <laughs> I seem to, I, I appear to be living in France. <laughs> oh, 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 great. I love it. So this time I'm doing, so you're in France, I'm in Belize. Let me see then. I was with Adamski, he was in Vienna. 
Um, yes, I, I mean, Adamski, we've been contacting each other again, which is brilliant. I love that. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a good man, isn't he? Oh, he's gorgeous. He is, I love that guy. He's such a unique character, and the interview with him was so much fun. He comes out with some really quite outrageous and very funny quotes and he doesn't even seem to realize it and he wonders why the press yeah. has to go mad over him but it's like he just comes out yeah. with these one-liners mm. and oh he's such a unique guy i, I really i really uh, enjoy him um can i play another quote because now that we're talking about um famous people from the past let me play another this is quite this is a longer clip so let me just play this for you so a lot of these are basically from a really big piece in the enemy, 5th of July, 1997. It's been a busy time for Glasgow DJ Howie B. He's watched the sun come up with the edge, shared a smoke with William Burroughs and taken tea with Vim Vendors, all between fitting in his slot on the military operation that is U2's Pop Mart tour. One minute he's in his East London studio twiddling his solo knobs, the next he's in Kansas rolling spliffs with William Burroughs. He was amazing, says Howie. He was drinking this stuff all afternoon, which I thought was soup. Turns out it's vodka shots. He's 87 years old and still likes a smoke. His manager's standing there going, whatever you do, don't cough. You know what happened last time. In LA, he was asked round to Angel Loving director Vim Vendor's house to drink tea and suss out music inspired by his new movie, The End of Violence. A week later, Ry Kuda's on the phone asking him to pop back to California to help with a mix. And tonight, he gets to hang out with some bloke called Liam Gallagher, whose band are opening for U2 in San Francisco. For me to go on after Oasis will be magic, he laughs. But in the midst of a celebrity roll call, which will over the next three shows include George Michael, Johnny Depp, Julian Lennon, Perry Farrell and Winona Ryder, the hyperactive Howard Bernstein remains deafeningly unaffected. There are no signs that Howie gets off on the star trip. Oh. Wow, so that was like a whole big celebrity roll call. I mean, your life was yeah. kind of nuts, wasn't it, for a while? It was totally nuts, Simon. It was, I was in this bubble, like uh, riding around in a chariot you know it was like uh, it was crazy you know uh, it was it was what was great about it for me I mean like the root of it was I had to share it I had to share that experience I didn't do it like okay right I brought as many of my friends in from Glasgow my family from London <clears throat> so the most important thing for me at that time was to, was to share, not to do this as a solo mission. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was, you know, I was flying around in a private jet. I was flying around, la, 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 la. And it wasn't just a private jet. It was a fucking 737, you know. It was like a 50-seater jet, you know. And it, it was like, okay. So bring as many people with me, uh, and the people that I were I was with at the time, they were. It was a social thing. It was a social thing, and it was, yeah, okay. I'm 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 going like this. My career is popping like crazy. Share it. Don't keep it in my pocket. Share it. Share that experience. Those big hotels those brilliant restaurants la 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 la, la. and eventually you know I, not eventually but the end thing is the performance yeah you know i was i was like doing front of house sound for you too yeah i was supporting them and then doing and then running as i was before i was playing for an hour before they played and then running and doing producing the actual show it was like you were producing the you know, show as well. I didn't even know that. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah it, it was it was it was crazy time. It was like so I was rehearsing the band with you two with with them, you know, rehearsing them like f three or four days between each gig. We did we did three gigs a week for about a year and a half, 
going around the world. Wow. I was rehearsing them, then doing sound checks with them, and then playing before before they they went on. I was whoever we had. We had Skunk and Nancy. We had Fun Loving Criminals. We had Rage Against the Machine. Wow. We had yeah. We had the big boys and girls coming in, right? And then I was slotted in for the last hour before the band came on. Then I would do my little set and then run to front of house and have two engineers there. Joe Hurley, right? Mwah. He's still doing their front of house sound. And I'd be standing there like that. Uh, a little bit more bass, Joe. I mean... I think it's a bit too much bass we've got there. I go, there's never too much bass, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and, wow. then, and then we and then we go after we we'd go after each gig we'd go backstage, right? And I would run through the gig. Bono, I think you could do better in this song. Edge, well, Larry, Adam, you know, I would go like that. And then Adam would go, How are you, man? I hit that bass note, that low, that low E. I go, yeah. He goes, we all jumped off the fucking stage. It was like, the, I go, was that good for you? He goes, yes, that was good for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, I love that. That's funny. So it was crazy. It was crazy. It was crazy. But you yeah. know what? I think it's probably a good thing. So what you what you did by bringing a lot of the people that you loved and cared about who were not in the industry, I assume, to, to yes, take them yeah. along. Because the thing that I found was, you know, when I was in the midst of all my MTV stuff, where, again, you know, you're hanging out with celebrities, you're in these really bizarre situations, really fun situations. Yeah. But then sometimes I found when I was with my friends who were not in the industry, I got embarrassed to share what I had done that last weekend because it felt like I was bragging because I would ask them, oh, what have you done? And they done, oh, I've done an extra shift at the supermarket or I have to take my dog to the Fed. What did you do? And I'm like, I felt like I couldn't even share it sometimes. I just felt so awkward because yeah, it really I, felt like bragging. But I guess with you, if you take people along, you could share that a lot more. Yeah, and also it's the people you're working with as well. It's how I would have brought my family in if they were going to get a big negatory from the people I'm working with. Mm. Like, what are you doing here? You know, who is this person? No. It's down to, it's, it's a people, music is, is a people thing. Yeah. It's a people thing. And, and if the people you're working with are not into people, au revoir. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess you were lucky with you too that they. I mean, because they're just great guys, right? I mean, they're I great guys, they're, and it yeah. was it was the same with Bjork. It was the same with Trick. It was the same with. Yeah. I, although, I would I would not bring people into a situation uh, that I wasn't comfortable with. I that that would be very very selfish of me, yeah. and that would be me showing off. I, I brought people into a situation I was really comfortable with. And I felt uh, I was loved. Yeah. So from that whole period, what are some of your favorite memories? Because I mean, already just what that article mentioned, there was some pretty bizarre moments. So what are some of meeting, the moments that are just stuck in yeah. your head? Meeting William Burroughs and spending an afternoon with him in an airstream with Bono and Edge and William's son and his manager was total, uh, you can't make it up. Yeah. I'd read all his books, I'd follow, I'd, and I, it was a day off from me. And I, that did, they were filming a video uh, uh, it, uh, that day, and William had agreed to do like a cameo role in the video. Right. And I was, uh, I was, this was happening, and I was at the hotel, sleeping you know like and then Bono calls up and goes look how we we're in an airstream with uh, William Burroughs I think it'd be a really good idea if you came up if you came over also you know he's looking for a wee bit of wheat 
And I was like, okay. Wow. And that was it. Right, could working with Right Cooder as well was incredible for me. Uh, Susie and the Banshees. Of course. Yeah, that's so funny because when you were asked yeah. before about who your big heroes were, before you got into music, it sounded like it was like um, um, Susie and the Banshees. Um, yeah. There was uh, Brian Eno. Right? Yeah. Um, Sly and Robbie. Like a lot of people that you have ended up working with. How I know. It's, that? It, it can't, it's a joke. Simone, it's a joke. It's a freaking joke. And... And also the work I did with those people, uh, I love, I, I, I play it and I go, it's like reading a diary. I didn't write a diary, I should have written a diary, but then I go, wait a minute, no, I've got a musical diary. And, and then, you know, Budgie, eh, uh, Steve, Susie Sue is like, whoa. And that was like, that was the first thing. That was like my first, uh, I don't know, a flag going up, yeah. you know, was, was, was this mix uh, that I did for them uh, called Peekaboo. Mm -hmm. And whoa, whoa, you know, and then Brian Eno, Brian Eno coming in and, you know, like, oh, Howie, you've got this, uh, I got this phone call. I never, at the time, I was married to a beautiful woman called Harriet. Uh, she still is called Harriet. Uh, <laughs> She's not married I, to her anymore. I'm not married to her anymore, okay. yeah. And uh, she goes, uh, there's a phone call. Uh, you two want you to go and uh, work with them on an album, they're, an experimental album they're doing with Brian Eno. And I go, fuck off. And uh, literally two days later, I was out in Ireland and sitting in a room with Brian Eno wow. going, Howie, I've prepared some things for you. Have a listen to this cassette and I'd like to know what your ideas are. This wow. is like 11 o'clock in the morning and I'm, I'm with a guy that I've been listening that is like totally colored my musical life. Wow. I, I, yeah. And he's asking for my opinion. What the fuck? Who do you think from all the people you've worked with? Because, I mean, the list yeah. is just endless. I yeah. mean, you've already yeah. mentioned Bjork, and then there's Massive Attack and Tricky, and yeah. I can't even think all the people. I mean, there's so many people you've worked with. So Soul to Soul, Goldie, um, Sushi and the Banshees. Uh, I mean, it's just you two, of, of course. But who have you learned the most from, or who, who has inspired you the most? Uh... Whoa. Did you learn? I mean, or have they learned? Yeah, I, 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 maybe it's the other one. No, no, no. I, 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 I listen. I do listen to one, yeah. and it's like one of the most nervous moments of my life was whenever you two asked me to produce the live show. This is like, uh, and and at that time, and when I got that call, I was sitting in the studio with Ray Kuda. And Rai, and I go Rai, and I know Rai, I know Rai's music incredibly well, and and I know his live performance is outrageous, and the bands he's worked with, etc. I said, Rai, give me some advice here, give me please, and this guy is the same age as my father, right? So it's like it's a sort of advice, anyway. So I go, I go Rai, and he goes, Howie. Get them to play quietly and get them to listen to each other. Yeah. The quieter they play, the more air they will move. Wow. That's the best, best bit of advice I've ever had in my life. Interesting. Yeah. The quieter they play, the more air they will move. And, and, I, and I carried that that message with me uh, for a year and a half when I was uh, producing the live show, rehearsing with them, bringing them closer together, getting them to play quieter on stage, looking at each other, all of, and it was like, whoa. And 
after about three or four weeks after well, when we started that that tour, all of a sudden it just went. Oh. Yeah, it was crazy. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So there's that, and then there's uh, Bono when he instilled to me the idea of signature. Uh, that he goes, Howie, I know you. I can hear your music. You know, if someone puts on a, one of your records, I know it's you immediately. And he goes, and he goes how, do pe- how do I know that? And he goes, because you've got a signature. So it was instilling, so that was really interesting. And then there's this other guy, Robbie Robertson. And he, and Robbie would go, break the rules. Yeah, you don't need to sing in a song. You can talk. Mm. Yeah, you can, you can talk. It's the story you tell. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Get the story across. So the... I can keep going on similar. I can keep there. Are, there's so many. Uh, there's not just one instance or one person. It's it's like that. And the most important thing is to listen. For me to listen to, if I ask a question, then to listen, what comes back and act on it. Yeah. Yeah. So let me play one more quote for you about um, the performance performances you this is quite a funny one silly one this is select magazine february 1998 and it asks loads of people like the apex twin ed simmons of the chemical brothers everyone the same question colin greenwood of radiohead it's great this how we be and the fran healy of travis same question have you ever been booed off stage so for Howie B, oh yeah, I was beautifully booed off stage in Warsaw the other week. It was a great moment. People were throwing their packed lunches, bottles of piss, potatoes, the whole effing works. I played for far too long and they were waiting for the U2 experience. So something had to give. <laughs> Do you remember that? I remember it very well. Yeah. I had to be protected by two roadies. Yeah, it was, what happened was, right. So I get, I'm playing, I'm playing for, I play. I went to play for an hour, 45 minutes an hour, right? Yeah. So I play for 45 minutes and then I get a little, one of the road, one of my roadies comes up and goes, oh wait, need to extend it. Uh, there's a, there's a technical problem, la 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 la, the band are not ready to go on yet. No problem. I right. carry on playing. I carry on playing. It's now... An hour and fifteen minutes, and there's this whole stadium. It's a it's a massive stadium, right? I don't know how many people. Eighty thousand people. They're not interested in me whatsoever. All they wanted they they want you too. Right. Right. All of a sudden, these things start coming at me. Right. Like even like tinfoil wrapped pack lunches. Right. Boof, hit me in the head, hit, and, it, and I, I take it for about two minutes. I keep, I'm taking it, I'm like, and I'm dodging, I'm dodging, I'm dodging, and I'm seeing it coming in. Then I made the massive mistake. I picked up someone's packed lunch and I chucked it back. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Then it was like a fucking assault, full on assault. The whole of Warsaw against me, right? Oh my god! Twenty seconds later, right? Uh, two of the two of these guys, two of the roadies, come charging on stage with a big flight case, like the lid of a flight case, to protect me from. And they go off, get off now, and we're all get. And it didn't stop. It went on for about. I think ten minutes. Boom, boom, boom. So that that was it. That was like it wasn't a boo. It was a salty <laughs> dog, a salty dog stage. <laughs> Fucking hell! Yeah, I remember that very well. I remember, and I was I was drenched in I fuck knows what it was, but it was like oh, it was terrible. Yeah, that was it. That was wow. that was that was 
incredible moment for me. You yeah. know, I actually find your level of success and fame actually really quite interesting because it's almost like, to me, it seems like you've had the best of both worlds. You have lived an experience like the top of the top with regards to what you achieved, the people that you were with, right. the, 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 the circles that you moved in. And yet you, you know, not everybody knows your name. People who know music know you, right? I right. assume you've always been able to walk down the road. You know, you yeah, have... apart from Amsterdam, apart from Amsterdam. Oh, seriously? That was a joke. That was a joke. So is that, <laughs> is that because we know music so well? Or no, it's a joke because you just can't walk when you're in Amsterdam. <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but do you think that um, you were lucky or did you at that point ever wish or dream that you were more recognizable around the world? Like that your face was more recognizable? Do you know what I mean? Like, did you want that level no. of fame? Or were you quite happy? I, I, my, still, my intention is, is being in the back room. I love, I love, see what I love uh, when a band, I produce a band and they go, and they go, thank you. We sound fucking great. Yeah. That joy that I get from that is, it, it, it's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. So no, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not, it's never about me. I mean, production-wise, in terms of my own music, then yeah, of course, it's about me. It's right. about my feelings, my emotions, my life. But whenever I'm, I'm working with a band, and I've had some problems. It's not always been like this. I've had, I've been sacked many times, Simon. <laughs> And you yeah. started as a T-boy. I love that bit as well, that you started yeah, the recording yeah. studio as a T-boy. You worked your way up. So I guess you had a few yeah. knockbacks along yeah, the way as yeah. well. Right. Yeah, yeah. So you you make mistakes. Uh, and the mistakes usually are, are related to ego mm. or putting your foot in or pushing to pushing yourself and not them the band or the artist. Uh, so I've, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned an awful lot. And, and I love, I still love what I'm doing. Yeah. I still, I can't see myself doing anything else. No. I love the fact that I'm feeding my family uh, with what I'm doing. Yeah. And I'm living on an island and people are going, what are you doing here? You're not a fisherman, you're not a farmer. How are you here? You live on an island? I live in a wee island, yeah. In Fr on the west coast of France. Oh my god. Yeah. How cool. So hold on, so describe the island to me. It's literally just you guys are on an island or it's like a bigger island and there's a bunch of people on it? Well, there's... What do you mean by... No, right. Which island? Like, is it a little island? It's called... a lake and then you're in the middle of it? or, or, or No, like... it's a, I'm, a, I'm in the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. It's called Ile de Okay. It's it's in the it's just above the Bay of Biscay. And uh, there's like three musicians that live here. Uh, and the rest are farmers and uh, fishermen and oyster farmers. I love it, that's so random. It's very random. And it's beautiful, it's beautiful. I've been here now four years. Uh, and it, I love it here. I love it. Wow. I, I'm literally like my front garden. I, you know, I, I can spit into the Atlantic Ocean from here if I've got a really bad cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Hey, Howie, what's, um, tell me a little bit what's, what's coming up for you. What, what are you working on right now? Um, okay, yeah. just now I've, I've just. Uh, I've got a few few projects. I've I'm set up a new record label uh, called Dogtooth Records. Is this your first uh, label since Pussyfoot? Because you had that exactly. Right, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I've set up a new label, and the first release on that comes out in May June. 
and it's and and the artist on that label is Tristan Bress and uh, he lives here. He lives on the island and he's an incredible bass player yeah. who I met in a, a patisserie. How funny. <laughs> yeah. So I've done that. That's that's I, I haven't done that, but I've created the vehicle for him to release his music. Right. Uh, then I've just finished producing an album with a guy called Clemens Hannigan, who's from Iceland. And this is like a, I would call it like a blue-eyed soul album. He used to be, or he still is in a band called Hatari. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you know them, but I've they were the Ice. I don't know. I can't. They were the. They were the Ice. They were the Icelandic band about three or four years ago that uh, brought up the Palestinian flag in Tel Aviv. I missed that, but that sounds interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. He's an incredible. They're they're an incredible band. Yeah. Then I'm, I'm work, I've just also finished a, an album with a, two Italian people from uh, Milan, called and they're called Pindar, and that's I would call that like a sort of trip hopish, guitar esque, sort of thing. Just on a techno album. Uh, You're <laughs> yeah. a busy man. That's what I do, Simone. Oh, That's what I do. What do, you, what do you want me to do? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you just played your first gig again. You were telling me that. And I played my first gig again. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've got my new album. I've got a new album coming out uh, November this year. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that the last time I brought an album was like 2016, 2015. So it's been a long time waiting, but... And it's a stunker, mm. and I've got it. I've I've got a singer. I've got singers from all young peeps from all over the world. Yeah. Uh, featuring on it, it's more a collaboration really than a Howie B album. Mm. Uh, I've got a guy called Liam Crocker from uh, Manchester. He's in a band called Winachi. Uh, I've I Clemens is appearing in it. Then I've got a. Yeah, I've been doing. Yeah, lots a lot. of stuff. There's a lot. I, so I guess the I, best way for people, wait, wait. if they want to know what you're doing, is to follow you on social media. I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I say yeah. yeah. I say I. I think I think. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's interesting. I've. I've Another thing I've been doing is I've been doing a meditation album too, Ooh. guided meditation, Ooh. which which is uh, I've been doing with uh, a friend of mine in uh, Bangkok called Peter, who runs uh, a brilliant music festival called Wonder Fruit. Mm. You need to check that out. It's really cool. And where can I find the meditation music? Because that sounds interesting as well. You go on to Wonder Fruit. Dot Wonder com. Wonderfruit.com, yeah. okay. All right, we'll go check We've it out. We've released about four or five already. Mm. And then there's going to be a, vi a proper vinyl release, uh, I think, October this year. Yeah. You keep it busy. Yeah. I like it. It's great. Yeah. And you're in a beautiful, yeah. beautiful spot on the planet. Whenever I left London, uh, it, I was a little bit nervous about it. And, as and I thought, the, the calls are going to stop. I'm not going to be meeting at the social things going to stop. And the social things stopped. The calls didn't stop. They just kept going. And I was just, and I, I moved into a different, uh, what's it called? Uh, genre. Not genre, but I, I, I was using my skills in a different way. Yeah. Uh, and working on my own, uh, and working in a digital world. So I've started, I've really entertained the whole digital world, music world of applications, plugins, la 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 la. And, and, I'm, f and I'm very comfortable with it. Well, technology makes it possible now. When I moved to Belize yeah. in 2001, yeah. 
that was it. I just moved away from everything, lost contact with yes. everybody. There was nothing, you know. I didn't even yeah. have a bridge to get to the other side of the river here. I mean, I literally was in the jungle, right? It right. Was, and now it's like the whole world is, is has been opened. I'm chatting to you. I mean, everything. It's just, you know, it's great. It's great. Anywhere. It's great. So, so definitely, um, yeah. yeah, it works these yeah. days. It hey, does Howie, work. Thank you so much for talking to me. It's been such a pleasure. Ple pleasure? It's been such a pleasure. <laughs> it's been a pleasure <laughs> catching up with you again. It's a good one. It's a good one. It's yeah. a good one. Thank you. Thank oh. you for asking me to do this. I really enjoyed this. Good. I really enjoyed this. Oh, yes. All right, Howie. Thank you so much. And good luck with everything. And I'm definitely going to do that meditation as well. That sounds good. Yeah, check it out. Check it out. I will. You'll be, I think you might be surprised. Yeah. I'm sure you'll keep surprising me. Thanks, Howie. Bye-bye, Sylvia. Bye-bye.